So hello everybody. Um, my name is uh, Rakha Ray and it gives me great pleasure to um, welcome Pankaj Mishra here today and to wel welcome you to this event. Um, the way we're going to structure this event is I'll first introduce Pankaj and then we'll sort of have a, a Q&A through which he will sort of talk about the book and then we're going to open it up to um, your engagement with his work, this book. Um, and he will answer um, some, of, some of those questions and, and, and engage with you. So, Pankaj Mishra had me at Butter Chicken in Lutiana. It's such a rich account of small town, middle class India, and it is, if anything, even more relevant today as it was in 1995 when it was first written. But before he wrote Butter Chicken in, uh, in Lutiana, he was an essayist. And he continues to write provocative, important, and widely read pieces, which appear in the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, The Guardian, The New Yorker, The London Review of Books, TLS, Financial Times, Washington Post, The Nation, Outlook, Harper's, you know, etc., etc. Now, I really can't introduce Pankaj Mishra without referring to his takedown of Neil Ferguson's civilization, The West and the Rest. Uh, in the London Review of Books, which made Ferguson threaten to sue him. But in a wonderful recap of the, what's we apparently called the ferguson Mishra affair, um, the Atlantic wi uh, Wire writes, clearly, Mishra emerges the winner. Ideally, it writes, and Ferguson's literary agent would agree, we'd all be talking about the brilliance of civilization, but we're not. Instead, we're talking about Mishra, Mishra, Mishra. After Butter Chicken, he wrote a novel called The Romantics, which won the Los Angeles Times Art Seitenbaum um, Award for First Fiction. But since then, he has uh, returned to nonfiction and has written uh, sort of books which include An End to Suffering, The Buddha in the World, Temptations of the West, How to Be Modern in India, Pakistan, and Beyond, which was featured in the New York Times 100 Best Books of the Year. And today, he's going to speak from his most recent book, which is Making Giant Waves, from the ruins of empire, um, the intellectuals who remade Asia. And I thought I would just read to you some of the adjectives that the reviews, uh, I actually haven't seen so, a book with so many reviews so quickly. Um, but I just thought I would just read you some adjectives, adjectives, adjectives from some of the reviews. The Economist, subtle, erudite, and entertaining. Amitav Ghosh in the Wall Street Journal, enormously ambitious and thoroughly readable. Vijay Prashad in uh, Himal, South Asian, tremendous, vibrant. Mohsin Hamid, superb and groundbreaking. Hari Kunzru, New York Times, timely and important. I'm going to give Orhan Pamuk a whole sentence. In his <laughs> brilliant new book, Pankaj Mishra reverses the long gaze of the West upon the East, showing modern history as it has been felt by the majority of the world's population from Turkey to China. Actually, two sentences. These are the amazing stories of the grandfathers of today's angry Asians. Um, Wang Hui, author of China's New Order and um, who, who's a professor of Chinese intellectual history uh, at uh, Tsinghua University, Beijing, um, writes, after Edward Said's masterpiece, Orientalism, from the ruins of empire offers another bracing view of the history of the modern world. And I could go on. Um, and we're so very, very happy to have uh, Pankaj uh, Mishra with us today, so I'd just like us to welcome him. So, Pankaj, I know you're going to sort of uh, tell us a little bit about um, about the book and why you wrote this book, but can I just sort of provocatively uh, so begin by saying that some have suggested that your book is a, a fuller, footnoted riposte to Ferguson's sunny view of uh, Western imperialism. So obviously this book was being researched, I you know, and written long before uh, you know this exchange started. But what was, I mean, was it uh, people like Ferguson, not just Ferguson, but people like Ferguson and their view of history that prompted you to write this book? Um, you know that that, that sort of whole um, vision that Neil Ferguson um, has, uh, it's been around for much longer than, say, the last decade or so. But the last decade has seen it become particularly prominent, even um, dominant, um, over uh, policymakers. Uh, I mean, it's, it's impossible to imagine the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan without the influence 
of this kind of thinking, uh, of this kind of revisionist history of empire. But uh, I think I was um, motivated by something else, and uh, in some sense, most of the work that I've done in the last um, decade or so has been uh, fueled by this sense of wonder, but also kind of unease at just how, over the last 200 years, uh, the experiences of people living in a you know, relatively small corner of Western Europe, how they managed to export their political institutions, their economic institutions, their cultures across this you know, very, very wide sort of territory to the point where there's hardly any corner of the world which is not westernized to some degree or other. And with that, and all of us in this room are familiar uh, with how you know, certain set of ideas, norms, institutions <coughs> have come to dominate our thinking, uh, whether we are historians or sociologists or anthropologists, how uh, <coughs> particular you know, forms of knowledge developed in one corner of the world, they still shape these dis disciplines and shape our knowledge of who we are, our places in the world. Um, so the book, this particular book, um, really emerged out of a desire to sort of, you know, look at aspects of history or moments in history which do not belong or are not covered at least at great length in this, you know, one-dimensional history of the West and of Western modernity in which all of us uh, are simply trying to catch up with a process that the West inaugurated and actually won back in the 19th century. Uh, to look at figures, to look at events uh, in the late 19th century, to look at people particularly who did not, who were not active in state building programs, who were not active in anti-colonial movements to the same extent the people we know from many uh, Asian countries were, or the people who are known to the general public at large. Um, so in that sense it is you could say that it is it is a response to that particular vision of history that uh, you can find in Neil Ferguson's books or many other books, uh, where the history of the world is essentially the history of the West, the history of Western modernity, and even post-colonial histories, even the history of the nation state in the post-colonial world, are adjuncts to that history of modernity, but because what they describe is the emergence of the, those nation states and their attempts to catch up with the West. And indeed, even the recent rhetoric discourse about the rise of India and China very much belong to that particular history of, of, uh, of modernity. Uh, so this was an attempt, a very small attempt, to you know, think about uh, another kind of history uh, or ideas that were in play that are not included in both uh, the imperial histories authored by the likes of Neil Ferguson and also excluded from the uh, histories of the post-colonial uh, nation state, which are you know, particular, which, which exclude things that do not form part of the trajectory of the, of the modern nation state. You know, that, that's so interesting because one of the things that um, so many post-colonial theorists, whether it's Fanon, starting with, you know, theorists of colonialism rather, starting with Fanon to Homi Bhabha, one of the things they talk about is really the colonization of the mind. You know, the, the creation, whether it's mimicry or whatever, it, it's just the, the sort of the, 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 the intellectual element of colonialism that has lasted far longer than the political element of colonialism. So what is your relationship to that? That is, are you actually saying that, the, that, that there wasn't that extent of colonialism and that we have to just excavate these histories? Sort of, how do you understand uh, sort of what, what I see your project as, which is partly sort of an, an intellectual decolonization? Well, I think there was obviously a degree of mimicry involved in uh, the, the, the sort of making and consolidation of uh, post-colonial Asia or post-colonial Asian nation states and ideolo ideologies were borrowed wholesale and swallowed. Um, but I think there was a moment, and this is a moment that this book seeks to describe, where uh, people hadn't embraced uh, the ideologies of communism or of uh, revolutionary Islam uh, to the same extent in the late 19th century. There was still that moment where people often with their feet planted in an older pre-modern world, were able to diagnose the peculiar nature of Western power without relying upon Western ideas or Western ideologies themselves, were able to also formulate a response to it, which did not depend upon borrowing the or, or developing the institutions of the nation state or 
uh, mobilizing citizens in, 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 in that way. Um, so I think there are, uh, you know, there are still there's, there are still ways in which one could look at that, you know, that whole process of uh, decolonization, intellectual decolonization, uh, and it's not just it's not uh, completed by the critique of uh, people who built those post-colonial states, and many of whom were indeed mimic imperialism, yeah. and, and Japan yeah. is, a, is, a, is a perfect example of that. It was the first to really adopt uh, the nation state, swallow whole the, the sort of political ideals of, uh, of, of European powers, and say, well, we can do this too, and this is uh, how we can mash the power of the West. Uh, and you know, most of us, most of us in Asia, have done that to a certain extent too. Um, but there were these people who had a uh, very different vision of things. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry. No, no, I, I absolutely. I, I mean, I want you actually to to, to 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 go back to Japan because the book begins with. <coughs> So it's, just, it's just so fascinating, sort of the, the reverberations of the, of, the, of the Battle of Tsushima. And I wonder if you could just share um, with this group a little bit about, um, you know, so the first 11 pages, essentially, just, just to fill them in on that, because it, the, 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 the idea of, of all of these uh, young people from India and China and Russia flocking to Japan um, to, to, to learn, um, you know, how to be, defeat the West is so fascinating to me. It, I mean, I, I used to uh, come across references to the Russo-Japanese War all the time, um, and you know, as a, as a great event in the history of Asia. But I hadn't quite realized until I started reading uh, widely and started reading, looking at obscure memoirs, looking at autobiographies, just how big it was um, in the emotional and intellectual life of many important Asian leaders or people at that time who were not leaders at that time, but were going to be uh, someone like Ataturk, who was just a soldier in Damascus, or, or Gandhi, who was a lawyer in uh, South Africa, the last person to be excited by a military battle. But there he was. Even Tagore was um, extremely thrilled by the news of the Japanese victory in this uh, Battle of Tsushima. Not to mention Sun Yat-sen, who was a professional uh, revolutionary at the time. Um, so a whole range of people, and, and of course people in Egypt, in, in, um, in Turkey, in Indonesia, uh, from all sides of the political spectrum, you know, these were secularists, many of them were uh, you know, thinking more and more of hardline um, ideologies of political Islam, but they were all excited by this, by this particular news. And this was proof that, uh, to many of them, that uh, the West could be beaten at its own game. And that one of the things you have to do is to adopt a constitution. I mean, there were many lessons to be absorbed from this. Uh, one of them was uh, that you have to have a constitution. You have to have some semblance of democracy, mm -hmm. so as to check the power of um, sort of despots. Uh, and you know, and the Persians did that. The Ottomans did that soon afterwards. So it had a real impact in, in that um, it actually shaped events, uh, not just you know, <coughs> provided emotional release to a lot of patients. Uh, but I think it's also a darkly ambiguous moment because it inaugurates not only uh, or exacerbates uh, <coughs> military strain within Japanese society, but it also deepens the notion that we have to be more like the West or more like the imperialist West. Uh, and, and, and you see that working itself out tragically over the next few decades, most prominently in Japan. Um, and then in Turkey and then various other places where ruthless programs of modernization and secularization, and China is also an example of that, are then carried out. So it's a, it's a, it's a strange little moment where, which inaugurates both a kind of intellectual and political awakening, but also describes how, you know, how the dark side of that, uh, which is yet to be revealed, which the 20th century then fully reveals. Mm. So, you know, this idea of um, Japan being an early model, um, you know, it also, in your book, it sort of, it widens out to the sense that there was something like an, an Asian response. And, and um, you know, in his wonderful review, uh, actually, uh, of, of, of your book, David Schulman, uh, I don't, have, you read, have you seen the review? He sort of says, well, you know, was there an Asian response? And can you sort of, um, and, and he sort of, he says, yes, there were responses which looked similar, but can you really say there was this thing called um, an Asian response? And, 
in my reading, I didn't quite think you were saying there was an Asian response. <laughs> so if you can just sort of talk a little bit. Yeah, there were, that. I mean, the responses were at many different levels. Mm. Um, there were different responses even within Japan. The whole idea of Pan-Asianism uh, was a very multi-stranded phenomena that there were any number of very serious people, idealists uh, like Tego's friend Okakura, mm. who was very invested in that. Then later on, uh, any number of militarists got interested in that. And, and that's our enduring um, memory of Pan-Asianism, that it became synonymous with Japanese imperialism. Mm. But over, the, over, over five or six decades, uh, many different people contributed to that. Not to mention how Pan-Asianism or the idea of uh, an Asian response to the West was articulated differently in many, in, in, in places like India or Egypt and Iran. So obviously there was no one single Asian response, but one thing that brought all these people together and often made them look towards Japan for, a, for, for inspiration uh, or uh, as a model was that um, they all had suffered uh, to, <coughs> to one degree or the other humiliation at the hands of the West. And this is a, this is a very powerful trope, and it's, it's, uh, it seems to me that humiliation has been much underestimated mm. factor in, in, in world history, that uh, how people can be driven by it. And I think for 1905, the responses to it, the, the sheer emotionalism of the responses uh, makes you realize the whole idea of beating a white power, why, why, that was, why was that so important? You know, the Russians weren't really strictly Europeans, but they were white, that was more important. And for people who had been uh, suffering for a long time uh, at the hands of in these imperial racial hierarchies, um, so that I think uh, you know bound people together in a way which allowed people to talk to each other and talk, compare notes about you know how do we deal with this particular challenge and to obviously construct the West as this uh, you know great monolith as diagnose it very closely about you know what uh, constituted its uh, great power, what were the secrets of it. Uh, and this, you see this sort of, uh, this, this, these shared dilemmas, shared responses, challenges, all across this broad sort of territory. So even if there wasn't a single Asian response, and it clearly wasn't, uh, there were these, uh, these, these sort of shared set of ideas and, and shared dilemmas there. Shared humiliation, yeah. Um, let me get back inside the book. So you. So you, you, you use the device of picking sort of core thinkers, right? So Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, uh, Lin Chichiao, <coughs> Tagore, and then others come in and out, uh, Ali Shariati, et cetera, they come in and out. Why them? Um, partly because um, I wanted figures who were not, uh, well, first of all, who were not extremely well known. Uh, no point in talking about people who have already been written about at Great Land much more. Mm -hmm. Uh, much better than I could ever write about, say, Gandhi um, or Nehru, for that matter, other two. But uh, I, I was interested in people who were not part of uh, anti-colonial movements, who didn't play prominent roles in <coughs> those movements, and were not sort of the kind of middle-class revolutionaries Fanon would critique, you know, as, as, as sort of one of those uh, internally colonized peoples, uh, people who were the first in their respective countries to respond to the challenge of Western imperialism, but did not uh, rely upon Western ideologies to counter that particular, uh, to, to counter Western power. Um, and to really obs explore more obscure and slightly marginal lives, also highly unusual figures like Tagore, who was a poet uh, primarily, but he was also you know, a, a, a very shrewd observer of the world around him. So I wanted to highlight that particular role of a man who's primarily written about, you know, and, and in terms of uh, you know, what he did, uh, what he wrote, um, uh, it, it's his poetry. But I, I think there's a whole, uh, you know, treasure trove there of his articles, of his speeches, his observations on different political situations, and his travels, which, as you know, were extensive. He was the first international <coughs> literary celebrity, and in that role, he traveled a great deal, met a range of people, and uh, commented on a range of uh, situations. And I wanted to bring that into play and to describe you know, how someone from India with that particular kind of background, how he responded to these events, what was his relationship with 
intellectuals in China and Japan. Um, so also to explore this world of interconnections and this cosmopolitan uh, moment in Asia where people traveled a great deal, met each other in places like Tokyo and Cairo. One thing I didn't write about was um, Tagore's visit to uh, Cairo and his uh, correspondence with uh, Saad Zaglul, the father of the Egyptian nation, which is also an important, and which also which connects Tagore to Al Afghani. Uh, he was already he was already a friend of uh, Liang Chichao. So it was really that to to in order to capture that particular moment of cosmopolitan exchanges and you know, these travels and people, again, formulating a response to the West without relying upon you know, the ideas of the nation state or ideas of revolutionary mass movements and, and so on, so the, the sort of borrowings that came later. Um, and I have to ask this question. There are no women in this book. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I must confess that's a serious flaw with the book. And in some sense, it's, um, it's inevitable because uh, the many reasons why women, or I could not find a women figure to fit into the, I mean, I was very conscious of it. And I thought very seriously of having a Turkish um, writer, Halide Edip, some of you might be familiar with her, who traveled to India a great deal. But she couldn't quite fit the timeline that this uh, book was primarily constructed around. Uh, and she was an associate of, she was a secular feminist, she was an associate of, Ataturk fell out with him later on, but she had extensive contacts with uh, any number of uh, major Indian leaders at that time. But then Pandit Ramabai was another mm. obvious okay. example that came to mind. But again, if you're thinking of a book in terms of a narrative and describing journeys, and also thinking of ways in which these journeys intersect, then uh, unfortunately I had to exclude not just Pandit Ramabai, but any number of people who could have been fitted into the uh, book's uh, trajectory and could have also resonate, would have been resonant, uh, uh, would have resonated with the themes as well. Um, but so is it partly because the ideas didn't travel and they, did, and they didn't travel? Is, is it partly because all of the people in your, the, the, your characters travel? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And their journeys uh, mm -hmm. constantly mm -hmm. intersecting. And also, the, I mean, another thing which is well known is that uh, very few women entered the public space, especially, especially in these societies at that time, especially in China uh, or in Egypt. There is a moment in 1919 in Egypt um, during the revolution when women come out and throw the veil, participate in large numbers in uh, political agitation against British at that time. There are other moments there throughout um, in these countries, but otherwise they were, they were not really much heard from at that point. Okay. I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions, and then we're going to open it up. Um, you say um, in, in, in the last part of your book, and I'm going to quote, no convincingly universalist response exists today to the Western ideas of um, politics and economy, and even those seem increasingly, um, in increasingly febrile and dangerously unsuitable in large parts of the world. So you're basically mourning the fact that even though at one point they seemed or even though there is a desire to challenge the hegemony of the West, and there have been ideas that challenge the hegemony of the West, there hasn't been one idea big enough to, to offer an alternative model. Um, and and I, think, I think that's right. But are there smaller, more localized responses that you um, draw inspiration from? Oh, yes, absolutely. And you see them um, you know, in practically every corner of the world, whether it's Java or rural India, people trying to uh, break away from this extremely destructive model of industrial capitalism or urbanization, industrialization, not having their economies become parasitic on international flows of trade and capital, you know, thinking of food security. There are any number of things one can think of. There's sort of smaller movements, smaller movements of resistance. But the problem is there has to be, you know, larger, subscription, to use this word, mm -hmm. to the particular ethic these movements um, exemplify, that we cannot have exceptions in this, you know, in this, in this sort of larger world knit together by Western imperialists and the systems of industrial capitalism in the last, last 200 years. Uh, otherwise, those uh, movements will remain the exception. Um, and they will also feel more and more this intense pressure on them to surrender, to give up. Um, so one reason why I you know, spoke of this sort of, in, in, in that way, of the universalist response, although I'm uneasy, of course, 
how can one not be after 200 years of this kind of universalism being forced down our throats of any kind of universalism? But uh, since we are living in a world created uh, largely by the West and, 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 and sort of interconnected by it in more ways than we had seen previously, um, I think a uh, credible challenge also has to have some sort of a universalist um, uh, ambition. Um, all right, I'm going to ask you my last question. And I'm going to quote from um, an op-ed piece you wrote to the New York Times on September 23rd. You wrote, um, in Afghanistan, local soldiers and policemen have killed their Western trainers, and demonstrations have erupted there and in Pakistan against American drone strikes and reported desecrations of the Quran. Amazingly, this surge in historically rooted hatred and distrust of powerful Western invaders, meddlers, and remote controllers has come yet again as a shock to many American policymakers and commentators who have promptly retreated into a lazy, they hate our freedoms narrative. This, of course, is, um, oh, let, let me actually read this, the next paragraph because it will, it, it will clarify uh, the point that I would want you to address. Um, and you continue, it is as though the United States lulled by such ideological foils as Nazism and communism into an exalted notion of its moral, mission, moral power and mission missed the central event of the 20th century. The steady and often violent political awakening of peoples who had been exposed for decades to the sharp edges of Western power. This strange oversight explains why American policymakers kept missing their chances for peaceful post-imperial settlements in Asia, and this, of course, is the the, the is, is, is sort of the crux of um, of uh, from the ruins of empire. Can you comment on the lessons you'd like, say, Obama, to learn from your book? Well, uh, isn't he um, anti-colonialist, Kenyan, and socialist? So he must already have <laughs> some lessons, <laughs> lessons uh, very keenly. You know, I think. Um, it is true that uh, because the American century uh, inaugurated uh, apparently in 1941 by Henry Luce uh, mm -hmm. coincided <laughs> with the decades of decolonization so that the whole uh, uh, sort of emergence and consolidation of uh, post-colonial uh, nation states in you know, much of Asia and Africa was sort of obscured in this part of the world by the need to preserve American supremacy in the post-war world, by the need to fight um, Soviet communism, the Cold War, the imperatives of the Cold War, where any number of nationalist movements across Asia and Africa could be described and thereby stigmatized as uh, part of monolithic communism. I mean, Vietnam is a, is a classic instance of that. Uh, it really meant that policymakers here, uh, generations of them, were never quite clear about what was going on in Asia and Africa. They were not clear about just how um, uh, sick people there were in that part of the world of European rule, and uh, how quickly after the First World War, after the Second World War, they had got rid of them. I mean, the slightest opportunity which was provided to them by Japan, um, by the Japanese uh, invasion and occupation of many of uh, Europe's old territories in Asia, and, and they moved so quickly after that to get them out of there, whether the Dutch in Indonesia or the, or the French, of course, resisted, but they were kicked out eventually. And then the Americans stepped in. So there's a strange disconnect between the official American sense of their place in the world and what they were supposed to be doing uh, morally and politically, and their idea of themselves, and the idea that any number of people in Asian countries were developing about what they needed to do. And we've seen these collisions over and over again. And you know, Arab Spring, which I see as an instance of delayed decolonization, brought those into greater prominence, where you have you know, the Secretary of State saying, uh, oh, this man is my family friend, Hosni Mubarak, uh, in complete disregard of you know, the fact that how, how of, of, of the fact of the <coughs> intense hatred so many people in Egypt feel for this man or felt for this man. Um, so there, I think there's so many instances of that kind of you know, collision between you know what people in Washington D.C. how they want to order the world, and how uh, people in different parts of Asia who just you know coming into their own, who just developing these ideas of sovereignty and self determination, the ambition and desires they have 
uh, to shape their own destiny. So I think, uh, <coughs> I suppose a book like this could, could make it clearer just you know, how prolonged and mm. painful mm. that struggle has been. But uh, it was uh, largely about you know, the freedom, having the freedom to make your own mistakes, having uh, the, the freedom not to be told by someone else what to do. I mean, imperialism was all about telling people <coughs> what to do. And, and, and that message somehow did not get through to Washington, D.C. in the last 50, 60 years. And it's still not getting through now. If you look at the Republican campaign, uh, which is all about going back to the 1910s, and uh, wielding a big stick and uh, bombing whoever doesn't fall in line. Uh, completely crazy, but there we have it. Mm -hmm. The Teddy Roosevelt world. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and let me, <laughs> let me turn it over to Gene Arshik. Yes. Um, I agree with you that we have a myriad of uh, resistances and that these resistances have started from day one, more or less, and continue. But can't you also say it's a kind of failure? That the resistances don't seem to do anything? That there's no result? Yes. Um, and the book really uh, describes a tragic arc. I mean, it is not, uh, by any means, a triumphalist account of right. the rise of Asia. It uh, describes how resistance to Western power depended upon borrowing some of these darker yeah. secrets of Western That's power, exactly and which led to various calamities within these newly independent nation states, and where it's the Great Leap Forward or the famine in uh, Mao's China, not to mention the massacres of you know half a million people in Indonesia. The, the post-colonial world is is, is replete with. Uh, disasters of that kind, uh, or the violence committed in order to shore up uh, the territory of the nation state. We see that every day in places like India and indeed uh, China, in Kashmir or, or uh, Tibet or Xinjiang or the Northeastern territories. So it's been in that sense that response, that resistance has been, uh, has been a failure uh, in that uh, it hasn't really developed what I call this response, the much needed response. Uh, no solidarity. Yeah, that too. That too has frayed. Uh, there was that moment after 1945, um, uh, the, the peak of that, of course, was Bandung. But then, you know, we don't, we don't speak of that anymore. Uh, when we do speak of Asia coming together now, it's mostly in terms of trade treaties or commercial groupings or that's more cynical security groups like the Shanghai uh, cooperation thing that the Chinese set up. So yes, I, I, I agree with you. I confess I haven't read this book, even though it is sitting on my urgent pile. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he used the word, you know, solidarity. The colonizing was not just external, it was also internal. Whether it's for labor, you know, internal to the West, whether it's for labor or resources. Some people say labor is a resource, a human resource. <laughs> But uh, did you find linkages in a horizontal way, you know, uh, from the West itself, or between the West and the colonized East or the rest of the world? Of linkages? Uh, linkages, you know, um, of between the colonies, not really, you know, um, outside the West, but also internal to the West. Like, you know, the labor, I mean, there was a resistance, you know, like there was a very strong socialist movement in the U.S., mm -hmm. for example. The labor movement was very strong, um, you know, during the, and it was a response to the Industrial Revolution yes. in, uh, in England itself. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, some of those linkages, yeah. like, you know, between you know, the Indian independence movement and the labor right in England, right? Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. No, but the, those were uh, fairly well established in the uh, 19th century, I mean, certainly amongst Indian uh, revolutionaries and uh, there were, there were. I mean, even someone like Ram Mohan Roy was uh, monitoring the various uh, political movements in, in in Europe breaking out at that time. And, and then there's a whole you know uh, tradition of Bengalis being very concerned with what was happening. But in terms of actual linkages, uh, I think that really only begins to happen late 19th century. And then, of course, you have. Uh, you know, the French Vietnamese, uh, the French communists sponsoring someone like Ho Chi Minh. Uh, the common turn really is the mm. first uh, major instance of 
you know, proper links being established between working class uh, organizations or movements in Europe <coughs> and with Asia. And that's where you know, that kind of international cooperation gets underway. But previous to that, it's hard to find too many instances of solidarity between the working class movements. And I mean, I don't know. I'm sure somebody's worked a lot like, on like this. Like Marx was sympathetic to the uh, you know, 1857 banks. He was indeed. I mean, there were was, there was certainly sympathies being generated by people looking, you know, uh, whether sitting in Allahabad or sitting in Calcutta and <coughs> looking at uh, what was happening in China at that time and what the British were doing to it in the Opium War. That was all, always being done. But um, in terms of people working together, establishing networks, that really only towards the end of the 19th century. And then, of course, we know that uh, there was a whole lot of you know, gun smuggling happening, uh, various other things started to happen. And a lot of people in Canada and North America were helping these um, Indian revolutionaries and indeed Chinese revolutionaries. Uh, Sun Yat-sen was very much part of that uh, network of overseas Chinese and also, also foreigners uh, at that time. Um, but I'd be very surprised if there was a network uh, within California, for instance, uh, that brought together working class white Americans at that time and the laboring Chinese and the Japanese. Uh, I don't know whether there is any instance of that. I'd be, I'd be really surprised if there was. Yeah, read the book also, although I'm very much looking forward to it. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to the really interesting, um, what seems to be the core of the book, which is the conversations that were being had between you mentioned leaders, you know, Tagore um, and Liang Qiqiao, how they actually met in Japan. I was wondering if you could speak a bit to um, the, the sources that you worked with, and also I'm interested in the language with, with which and in which they engage between each other. Because that that time. Anti-colonialism was, you know, anti-French, uh, anti-Dutch, anti-German, uh, and 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 French was much more commonly taught than it is now. But we've moved to a, a sort of an era now, also of sort of almost Angloization in terms of the discourse, the international discourse. Mm -hmm. and, and within Asia, it seems that I might be wrong, but I'm going to say am. But that China is is the one state that's really had this global push and has this global push to make uh, Chinese, uh, Mandarin, you know, a lingua franca on a par with English and, you know, so I just wonder if you could speak a little more to what language they were talking about. Yeah, language doesn't really make a huge, um, it doesn't become a major issue there. It seems mm -hmm. like um, there are any number of uh, interpreters there. And, mm -hmm. and when Tagore goes to um, China, in fact, he is tailed everywhere by this interpreter who became subsequent, who was already a, a well-known poet. And same with Al Afghani's travels, uh, he seems to have slipped in and out of different languages and also always had people who were ready to interpret for him. Uh, so it doesn't, nobody's making particular claims upon <coughs> language or linguistic identity at that time. Maybe it's a bit too early for that uh, in the late 19th century uh, or, or, or early 20th century for that, uh, for those claims to be then, you know, subsumed by larger nationalistic <coughs> claims. Uh, that they were still moving across this sort of multilingual arena without encountering a whole lot of you know, chauvinisms um, about language at that time. Thank you. Rahul, did you want to add it? Oh, the person behind Boy, yes. Um, I want to return to the, the issue of American deafness to, to the rest of the world. And I'm thinking a little bit about um, West Ed's work on the global Cold war and how, you know, post. 45, the American State Department viewed all these um, movements of decolonization as sort of through the lens of the Cold War and how can they manipulate the outcomes so we make sure they stay on our side. And um, so that was one sort of refractory lens that was that was applied that, that created this sort of amnesia or inability to see. But then um, I'm also thinking about um, Ekbal Ahmad, who, who argued right, that the Iranian Revolution was the most significant political event of the 20th century, in his estimation. And that was the moment where um, you know, the American government was, was forced to reckon with the fact that they wouldn't be able to manipulate all the, the, the actors. Um, and that, but, but we've applied a different refractory lens there, the, the sort of clash of civilizations hypothesis. Um, so, so I just keep thinking about Ahmad's argument that this is the most significant um, political event of the 20th century. And, 
And I know that there are Islamists who would argue that Islam is the universal response, right? So, so I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts on, on, on Islam and, and more specifically maybe connections between the Iranian Revolution and the Arab Spring and, and how that counters Western hegemony? Absolutely. Um, you know, also the other person who also called it, uh, maybe not on the same scale um, as the greatest, important, most important political event of the 20th century, but somewhere near, close to it, was uh, Foucault, who traveled to the uh, Iranian Revolution, wrote about it, and then uh, basically concluded that this was an extraordinary event because for the first time the, the universalist claims of uh, the West were, had been challenged, had been overturned, in fact in uh, a country by the power of uh, revolutionary Shiism. Um, so he was also very clear about the, uh, about the extraordinary thing, about this extraordinary event. Um, I think, you know, the way in which the whole revolution developed um, after 1979 has definitely diminished its claims to being this, you know, universalist uh, challenge or this ideological counterpoint to Western materialism or to Western civilization. Because in the beginning, of course, and the ideologues of the revolution, people like um, Ali Shariati or Jalali Ahmed, um, they were, uh, their critiques obviously dovetailed with many Marxist critiques, in fact, at that time of, uh, of, of sort of the, this, this peculiar relation, you know, relationship of dependency, the relationship between the uh, Periphery and the uh, the center, the imperial center. They were already talking about these things before these were codified later on. But it, the revolution, the Islamic revolution, as it developed, took on essentially uh, remade the whole apparatus of the police state in uh, in, in, in that with the Shah had set up originally, and in in many sense became even more brutal. So even though uh, the supreme Iranian supreme leader now talks about has talked about uh, Muhammad Iqbal being the great inspiration behind the Islamic revolution and claims all kinds of intellectual genealogies for the revolution. The fact is that this whole apparatus of coercion, uh, this whole uh, state uh, which relies upon uh, terror and brutality, uh, simply cannot be seen as a as a as a as a as a response as a universalist response to, uh, to the West. I do think. In looking at it from the perspective of the West in 1979, yes, that was a great shock. That was a very serious shock. And indeed, the rise of um, parties with an explicitly Islamic orientation in large parts of the Arab world, in Egypt and Tunisia in particular, and maybe in more places too, uh, that has also shocked a lot of Western policymakers. Because I don't know, for some reason, this, this, this myth persists that societies, as they modernize, will eventually get rid of Islam, or it will be somehow relegated to the uh, private sphere, and we we'll all, you know, basically take our direction from uh, the secular humanist societies of the European Enlightenment, and so on. So this this fantasy somehow persists. So every time uh, a party, or or every time uh, a sort of explicitly Islamic party either wins an election or is seen as becoming important, there's this kind of panic attack. Uh, we thought we had done away with this, or it had disappeared. In Turkey, too, I mean, they thought this was now uh, a done deal. It had secularized, and uh, year, decades and decades of hardline secular rule. But again, we see the revival of uh, popular Islam there, and of course, the revival of political Islam there. Um, not the same, not in the same ways, of course, but nevertheless, um, overturning our ideas about that 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 part of the world. Um, I think Islam, because the way in which, you know, this is a cliche, but because in a way it's more than a religion, it's a way of life, and offers so many notions of morality and social justice to its adherents, it's going to remain a live political force for a very long time, even if, they, if, even if it doesn't offer a blueprint of the kind the West has provided for the reorganization of human society. Um, so in that sense, we will see, we will continue to see assertions uh, based upon political assertions, based upon Islam in different parts of the world. And it will be around for whether it constitutes a universalist challenge, you know, that remains to be seen. Um, and certainly the example of Iran has not been 
very encouraging. Well, my question was a little bit related to that. I mean, I was wondering how, if you look at these often you know, backward-looking, if you like, historically, nostalgia-based movements of, you know, kind of Uma or Gandhi's notion of what the Indian state should be like, or Hindutva, or whatever, what happens to them when they seem to be victimized again by a resurgence of that, the Indian state becomes, just as you say, a, ma a kind of replica of the British colonial state, a kind of industrial military state, uh, and yet reveres Gandhiism as a kind of its founding philosophy. So there's a nostalgia for this, and yet it's not, in fact, in practice. Gandhians are regarded as somewhat quaint uh, and amusing these days. But, so what is it that accounts for the repeated failures of these counter-Western movements? Well, uh, actually, another victim of that kind of irony is Tagore. Um, who's the author of, as you know, not just one, but two national anthems. The, the most consistent, even, uh, I mean, more consistent than Gandhi uh, a critic of, as a critic of nationalism. And here he is seen as a, as a, as a maker of uh, founder India, the author of the national anthem. But I think, uh, you know, a lot of the people I describe in the book had this non-sectarian idea of political community, of a larger ideal of, of humanity, which, and, and obviously uh, instinctively recoil from the idea of nationalism because of that. Uh, one person I did not discuss at uh, any length in the book, um, he was Liang uh, Chichao's mentor, Kang Yue, whose whole ideal of, uh, he set out this, this particular notion of, uh, of humanity and of a political community, which had nothing to do with the nation state, was actually quite antagonistic to the ideas of the nation state. And of course, as you mentioned, Gandhi had his own vision on that, Tagore, and various other people in the book. And, and of course, the Ummah, the idea of pan-Islamism also incorporated that. It wasn't just this militant thing it's made out to be, uh, especially in our time. But uh, what I, I also try to describe how all these ideas had to contend with the geopolitical pressures of their times, and in the end, they were vanquished by the imperatives of uh, you know, survival in many instances, where people felt they had no alternative but to embrace these ideas in double quick time and to reject violently sometimes all the previous ideas suggested, you know, all the non sectarian ideas. And you see that very happening very fast in China. With someone like Liang, who was an inspiration to all generation of Chinese leaders and intellectuals, being so discredited and being mocked and, and heckled by these young Chinese radicals who then go on to become the leaders of, uh, of, of the new China, uh, who think uh, the, you know, they, these, these ideas are completely useless. What we need is a strong nation state. We need to mobilize these citizens in the ways that the Europeans have been doing it, and these are the methods we need, uh, however brutal and ruthless uh, these methods might be, but that's what we need to do. So all those you know, ideas fall by the wayside, all those alternatives. Um, but I think it's still worth reflecting on them, and that's you know, one reason why to, why to bring them up today when nation states like India invest so much of their energy and resources into upholding, into clinging to these sort of um, outdated ideas of um, European nationhood. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, one of the, I guess, colonial tricks is to, uh, uh, colonial occupation is to play uh, peoples against each other within that to sort of, I guess, compensate for <coughs> the inherent weakness of being on foreign territory and so forth. But I'm wondering, <coughs> amongst the, <coughs> pardon me, the intellectuals or movements that you described at the time, was there a sense of uh, trying to get beyond what might be called an occidentalism, a sort of a a uniform regard of the whole West and becoming sensitive to the differences, the fact that the colonial enterprise itself was competitive and different cultures, you know, inhabited Europe, could there be a, a playing off of one against the other that was that conceived and, and, and thought of, or, and perhaps in terms of also shopping around for bits and pieces of useful material from different uh, European countries? Thank you. I think in the late 19th century, uh, when people really didn't travel much to Europe, Alaf Ghani went to um, Europe, and in fact, uh, he relied a great deal upon French and uh, English uh, sympathizers. Blunt, the uh, Arab file poet, was uh, was a supporter of his at one point. 
So there was some you know, connection between these figures and political tendencies or individuals or movements within the West who were more favorable to the idea of you know, uh, these sort of Asian people striving for se separate nation or, or striving just for dignity. Um, but there wasn't, again, uh, sort of any kind of formal contact. And when I think people like Liang looked at the West, they did see a varied West, one that was uh, very exploitative and ruthless in the colonies. But at home, it had built up a kind of admirable liberal civilization where various political rights were being extended slowly to uh, minorities, to women, being allowed, given the right to vote. And so they took away from their travels this sort of picture of uh, a West that could be liberal. But then uh, it was also easy for them to conclude that this kind of liberalism was one side of imperialism, that what it did was, you know, in, in some sense, that liberalism was made possible by the fact that these countries had, had, had sort of broken out of their geographical uh, boundaries <coughs> and had conquered so much of their own world and had gained access to territories and resources before anyone else. And so they had the time to build these liberal civilizations at home. So this, they ended up with these slightly ambiguous and dark visions of the West itself. So it's very hard to see, you know, for many of them, how they could then combine how, or join hands with political forces in those countries. Because even, even liberalism seemed like something that could be complicit with. With, uh, with imperialism. Um, and that became, later on, uh, the experience of many political activists who would appeal for help to many of the supposedly liberal elements within, within the West and were rebuffed uh, often. And, and actually, many of the figures um, I quote in the book have very stringent views on, on, uh, on Western liberalism in general. I mean, obviously, they knew they weren't going to get any help from the reactionaries, from the diehard new imperialists, or the conservatives, uh, the right wingers, but um, they were led down also by the uh, by Western liberals. Yes, yes, yes. You have alluded to humiliation as being a very powerful motivating factor, and at the end you said that the little movements are not going to amount to anything unless you know, they can have a larger idea. And I would like to comment that what we are seeing, including in this country, certainly objective statistics of the delegitimization of the present system, uh, I'm not, and first we can take care of the marginalized, where the prison population has grown from to 300,000 in 83 to over 2 million today. But leaving that aside, the most recent was that there is a decrease in life expectancy of working class white people. So, so to me, that is some kind of delegitimization. And then you go across the seas, and you see Spain, Portugal, Greece. So, the whole, you know, what the idea that this system can deliver a dignified existence is being challenged. Um, and so, would, do you have any thought? And I think to some extent, the Arab Spring was a reaction also to material difficulty. So, would you comment on that? Yeah, no, I think these are very important factors, and, and you're absolutely right in saying that um, economic reasons uh, motivated uh, a great deal of the, uh, there was a lot of political disaffection stemming from those those factors in Egypt in, in, in particular. And because of the excessive focus on people who were on Facebook and Twitter, uh, the Western media obscured the role the working classes played in the uh, insurrection in, in Terry Square. Um, I think, I mean, to answer your question very broadly, I find this, I mean, this the, the fact that uh, economic liberalization or globalization hasn't delivered, even in the countries of its origin, where it has left uh, millions of people feeling cheated and angry. Um, for people in India to then expect uh, globalization forces of other the, the belief systems that come with globalization and the kind of policy adjustments and the institution uh, tinkering that comes with it, all of that to then uh, help India deliver on its even grander promises to 1.2 billion people of giving them all consumer consumption-oriented lifestyles. Um, this is an even bigger fantasy 
And uh, I think we found ourselves in a place like India in the last few years, very unenviable position of wanting India to become more like the United States, when the United States itself is ceasing to be the United States. Um, and this is, a, this is a trap, this is a particular impasse that we now see you know, in practically every emerging economy in the world, is that we, for, for so long we were set this, uh, again, you know, we were told that this is a race and uh, the, the finishing line uh, was strung up by the West and we could all, uh, let's see who's, who will be the first to um, get there. And we find that uh, actually uh, none of us will get there. Um, and that uh, the idea of 2.6 billion people being uh, delivered from poverty and, and deprivation um, and being ushered into this utopia of middle class uh, consumption. Um, it's not happened in, in the US itself. Uh, it's not happened in Western Europe. And you see now howls of protest uh, against uh, the, the sort of the, the way in which they have been cheated. And I mean, you can only imagine the kind of social unrest and political disaffection and the militant forms it might take in places like India and China. It already is taking that form. You want to follow up? OK, go ahead. Uh, and I'll take have a you followed questions. that the Japanese anti-nuclear activists who have come to Tamil Nadu were expelled? No, no. Was this uh, yeah. yesterday? Mm -hmm. really. I mean, I can't see exactly that. They say they're going to get rid of all nuclear plants. Really? In Japan? But they are <coughs> saying. Yeah. Hmm. Another questions? Last couple of questions. Well, in that case, I want to thank you very much. It was a, it occurred to me as I was listening to you and I was reading uh, reading the book and I was reading the reviews of the book that I think for many many people, um, not just um, in the West but but particularly people in Asia, I think this book really comes as uh, as as something that is um, that actually gives them hope because it 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 it. it it excavates a history of, of, of a time when, when, um, when alternative ideas were possible, um, when South to South conversations were, were vibrant and vital, and and and, um, and even if there were conflicts, because I know, you know of course, that they, they didn't all agree with each other, but that, that these conversations were possible, were important, and helped, in fact, to shape the the, the insurgencies, and even if they weren't perfect, that that, that they were really important and. And I think that for that um, alone, I want to thank you for writing this book. Um, and um, now I want us all to you know, please join me in, in, in thanking Pankaj for this conversation and for writing this book. There are some books for sale outside, and there is a reception to which you are all welcomed. And I'd also like to um, thank the anthropology department for co-sponsoring this talk. Thank you so much, Pankaj.